Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Well, uh, we're live tonight. My voice is much better. Every year about this time, I uh, develop a case of uh, bronchitis. And I have to be careful with that because uh, if I'm not, I'll lose my voice completely. And then, uh, then we're really in trouble. And uh, one year I didn't take care of myself and uh, got pneumonia. And uh, came pretty close to buying the farm. So, in the winter time, whenever I develop these throat conditions, I try to uh, rest as much as possible and uh, let it run its course and uh, go away. Tonight, I'm going to sort of wing it here because I don't know how long or if, in fact, my voice is going to last for two hours. So, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of impartation of information to you and uh, then we're going to uh, open the phones and let you guys do most of the talking and see what's been going on uh, I know that I need to inform some of you anyway that last Thursday night's broadcast was a rerun listen to me carefully I announced that at the beginning of the broadcast and somewhere after the uh, top of the first hour I announced it again, that Thursday night's broadcast was a rerun. It was a rerun. <laughs> Some people thought it was live, and uh, calling and calling and trying to tell me how, how hard they were trying to call. Uh, it was a rerun from November the 11th, if you'll remember that fateful night when uh, the phones uh, apparently were not working, and uh, we just went off the air there was no point in staying on the air. So, uh, tonight, uh, I've got some uh, interesting stuff to read to you. I'm going to read to you. I'm going to read you a bedtime story. <laughs> so, put on your jammies, get all comfy, get your little cup of whatever it is that you like to sip on, and uh, Uncle Billy's going to read you a bedtime story. listeners to this broadcast already know the subject, I'm sure.
people ask me, ladies and gentlemen, why it is that I play this type of music when I get ready to uh, discuss certain subjects on the hour of the time. It's because it evokes an air of mystery. It makes you sort of go into a uh, thoughtful mood. And uh, the music is mysterious. It makes you wonder about its origins, what it's all about. The same is true for what you're going to hear. This is from the Rosicrucian Digest. The Rosicrucian Digest. I'm going to read to you from uh, issue number 2, volume 74, 1996. For those of you who may have a copy and may wish to uh, look it up. And uh, I think you're going to find this very interesting. You see, everywhere I look for the answers to the real meaning behind the veil, to what's really going on in the so-called fraternal orders, the mystery schools, the secret societies, I always come up with the same answer. Always. And it took me years and years and years to be able to understand the symbolic language wherein they hide their esoteric, which means hidden, religion. And religion it is, ladies and gentlemen. Make no mistake about it. And uh, don't ever believe. Don't ever believe that you can sit down and honestly ask them questions about these things and, and really believe that they're going to give you honest answers. They cannot. They have taken blood oaths upon pain of death never to reveal the secrets of the Lodge. And so they cannot, and they will not. And the tenants of the Lodge teach them that when it comes to a choice between telling the truth and telling a lie, they will tell a lie in every single instance without fail. In fact, they are chronic liars. Now, I don't care if it's your father, I don't care if it's your mother, and I don't care how much you love them. You may think they would never betray you and never lie to you. I'm telling you right now, you're mistaken. You are mistaken. This is called the quest for the Holy Grail. The Grail Guardians by Errol DeMott. Earl DeMott, Master of Education and FRC. FRC stands for Fraternitas Rosae Crucis, which means that he is a member of the Order of Rosae Crucis. Listen to this very carefully, ladies and gentlemen. I think, I think that if you pay attention, if you're listening closely, and especially for those of you who've been following what I've been teaching you throughout the years of this broadcast, you're going to find it extremely interesting, maybe even revelatory, and certainly confirmative. In the grail romances of the 12th and 13th centuries, the Grail has been associated with a family who were its guardians, and a special temple or castle where the Grail was kept and protected by the Grail King and its guardians. Now, I want to acquaint you with some remembrances for those of you who may have run across this word guardian before. If you've ever I've been to the Luxor Hotel. There's one wall. It's not easy to find or easy to see if you've been on the boat ride on the Egyptian barges. Then you may have seen it. A portrait on a wall of the Guardian. The Guardian. In the UFO myths a couple of years ago, Someone surfaced called The Guardian and pretended to be feeding information to Art Bell and some of these other Looney Tune whacked out deception artists called The Guardian. 
He also sent out a videotape of a purported extraterrestrial spaceship landing, which of course was fake, was false, was a hoax. It was called The Guardian. And you see this Guardian pop up every once in a while in strange places doing strange things, usually leading people astray with misinformation, disinformation, and just outright bold-faced lies. Well, listen carefully as we continue here. Whenever something important needs to be elaborated upon, I will attempt to do that for you. Because I know that many of you are novices <laughs> in your quest for the truth. The idea was given vogue with the appearances of Robert de Bourne's Joseph of Arimathea and the account entitled Quest del Saint Grau, written anonymously. Both appeared within the last decades of the 12th century. Robert de Boron related that after the crucifixion, Joseph, the rich merchant who served Christ so devotedly and who collected the blood of Christ in the cup of the Last Supper, went on to establish a line of grail kings. They were expected to keep the secrets of the grail, in this case the chalice, and pass it down to their successors. They were grail kings by right of moral worthiness. In these and other grail stories in the context of Arthurian lore, the successors to the grail king, that is, Percival and Galahad, passed the initiation tests of round table fellowship. Though all of Arthur's knights could be described as knights who sought the grail, the literature places these two in the grail king category. They were knights of the grail. Now, in all of these orders and mystery schools and secret societies, you will always find reference to that which was lost and is being sought. In the Freemasonic order, it's the lost word of Freemasonry. In the ancient Egyptian mysteries, it was the lost phallus of Osiris. In... Uh, The Arthurian lore, it's the lost grail for which they search. At the beginning of the 13th century, Wolfram von Eschenbach elaborated further on the importance of the grail guardians in his account of Parzival. He talks of grail knights who were bred to the pure life and who had the special task of keeping the grail. They were summoned to serve the grail after they had passed a test of worthiness. Wolfram seemed to be suggesting that the hand of God acting through the power of the grail or some other mysterious criteria played some part in the recruitment. This, in turn, could imply that the grail knights were a closed secret society in which tests, ritual preparation, and initiatory rites were involved in the process of selection. Of course, it always is. The Grail myth took shape in the time of the Crusades, when two religious faiths found themselves locked in holy war in Palestine for about 200 years. The Templars, or Knights of the Temple, who played a leading part in the Crusades, seemed to manifestly play this role as grail guardians as implied or stated in the accounts of three writers on the grail myth. The anonymous author of the Perlisvaus and Wolfram in his Parzival were chiefly responsible for identifying the grail knights with the Order of the Temple. Founded in A.D. 1118, the order started from a group of nine men who took the sword to protect pilgrims in the Holy Land. It grew in size and influence over the next two centuries, acquiring fame for exceptional courage and fighting skill and for high moral conduct. Or at least, that is the perception. That the Templars also amassed great wealth through bequests of property, military success, and by acting as bankers, traders, and security agents in most of Europe and the Mediterranean is also part of history. 
In fact, the Knights Templars were the first international bankers. Mention has also been made of their influence in the building of the great cathedrals of Europe. Peter Bryce notes, The Templars had the aim of guarding the routes to the Holy Land, which can be taken literally, but also in a more profound sense. Their activities put them into contact with other civilizations. They seem to have formed an intellectual link between East and West, and to have become guardians of a great deal of esoteric knowledge. And right there I've got to pause and take a drink of water. You all know why. Uh, <clears throat> that's much better. Now the author of the perilous vows betrayed by the content of his story of Percival that he belonged to an order of soldier monks. How many of you have heard Lieutenant Colonel James Bo Greitz refer to himself as a soldier monk? Remember what I told you about that man? If you understand the language, you can out the members pretty quickly. This in itself would not be sufficient as an explanation for the author's anonymity since the church approved of militant orders to defend the faith. But the writer went on to mention the presence of a conclave of initiates in the Grail Castle who were familiar with the Grail and Percival's meeting with masters who could summon 33 other knights by clapping their hands. Now those of you who have been listening to me teach you the secrets of the Lodge for years should have recognized some pretty important symbols there. So let's go back and talk about that. First, is the presence or the belonging to an order of soldier monks, then militant orders to defend the faith, the presence of a conclave of initiates in the Grail Castle, who were familiar with the Grail, and Parsifal's meeting with masters who could summon 33 other knights simply by clapping their hands. The knights that appeared had Templar insignia and seemed of an age. The mysterious or magical connotations implied here would not sit well with any kind of orthodoxy. Such references, however, and the writer's detailed knowledge of close combat and its effects on the human body clearly pointed to Templars as the Grail Knights. Wolfram was much less reticent to reveal he had some connection with the Templar Order. You see, he was either a Teutonic Knight or Templar and probably followed the Crusader track to the east in his poem. He talks about the Grail being guarded by knights who are the purest who seek adventure as a test of their worthiness, and who were also sent to be rulers of countries. That's a key piece of information. Who were also sent to be rulers of countries. If purity involved monthly asceticism, sacrifice of possessions, a willingness to die for a noble cause, and indomitable courage in the face of overwhelming odds, these attitudes found no better expression than in a Templar knight. Wolfram actually coined a word for his Grail Knights. They were Templis, Templison, or Templison is the correct one, Templison, the Iron Men of the Temple. He also described the Grail King whom they served as one who rules over an invisible our spiritual kingdom, and Lord of Invisible Brotherhood. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, has hermetic undertones. Grail Knights, Templars, were the physical embodiment of their archetype in heaven, according to their beliefs. That he meant to equate the Templars with the Grail Knights is confirmed in one of his later poems, The Young... Oh boy. 
it's not that I can't pronounce it, it's that this copy is bad and the uh, letters are blurred. I believe it's the young titurel, T-I-T-U-R-E-L, the young titurel. The Grail Castle here resembled a Templar fortress and even had a circular chapel, the way the Templars used to build them. He went on to say that the castle was guarded by Templar knights. Such feelings about the Templars were shared also by other Grail writers. In the Quest del Saint Graal, the sanctum or model of the home of the Grail resembled a model of the Holy Sepulchre to be found in Templar commanderies everywhere where the most sacred rites were performed, and Templar knights guarding a magnificent temple of the Grail is mentioned by Albert von Scarfenberg in his The Younger Titural, A.D. 1270. Now, some would argue that the Templar Brotherhood and the Guardians of the Grail were actually one brotherhood, not necessarily protecting a chalice or some other magical object. They could have been guarding something intangible, some secret, some treasure, or some special knowledge as a source of power from which derived their moral strength and which made them super knights at that time, capable of transcending national and human boundaries. One of the implicits or the implicits of the Joseph of Arimathea legend is that Jesus may have passed on some secret or secrets to Joseph when the latter served his time in prison and Jesus visited him. This secret was to be passed on to the grail keepers who succeeded him. If the grail guardians were conceptualized as a spiritual host, and if they were manifesting in some physical form on earth at a time when the grail legend enjoyed high popularity, then the Templars would be this visible example of service to the Grail. Once again, we must take a drink of water. The intimate connection of the whole Grail myth with Templarism was zealously promoted in the first half of the 19th century. Intriguing articles appeared before the public which sustained the idea that certain baptismal fonts and vessels were like grail vessels, that the grail poems were written to glorify the Templar order, that Templar symbols and doctrines were borrowed from the grail legend, that the same ideal of union of knighthood and sanctity was found in the Templar order and the Grail Guardians, and so on. It is even possible to envisage that the Templar Order, among others like the Teutonic Knights and the Hospitallers, was the manifest model upon whom the ideal conception of the Grail Guardian was built up by the Grail Storytellers. Now this becomes especially significant. If we place the Templars within the spiritual lineage of the secret initiatory tradition of the mystery schools. And ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly where you had better place them. The Templars held their meetings in private. They initiated their recruits within their chapels in secrecy and defied external attempts by courts of the time and by posterity to discover the secrets in their worship. Common elements in thought and practice of certain initiatic schools which, due to their persistence over time and their value in raising the consciousness of humanity, at least that's what they claim, have come to be recognized as representing that movement called the Great Tradition. Its teachings were religious or mystical, usually not subject to the dogma of any particular faith. The Rosicrucian order finds its roots in the mystery tradition of ancient Egypt. The inspiration and contents of this tradition have been reinforced through additions from the mystery teachings of individuals and groups in ancient Greece, China, India, Persia, 
and many other lands, not forgetting the contributions of modern science, philosophy, and psychology, and its own research which confirm or clarify the ancient wisdom of this tradition. Historical links can be traced between the Rosicrucian Order, AMORC, and Rosicrucian activity in the late Middle Ages. That is, in the time of the Crusades, Templars, Alchemists, Cathars, Provincial Kabbalists, and Grail literature. The area of the most intense activity for all these groups was the south of France, although the movements were widespread throughout Europe. It is reasonable to assume that some Templars were Rosicrucians and vice versa. And the same could be said of Templars and Cathars, and Cathars and Rosicrucians, that some Templars fault in the Albigensian Crusade against Cathars does not negate the cross links between the movements. These Templars felt their first loyalty was to papal authority, from whom they received their authority to function. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the myths of the Templar order. In fact, the Knights Templar existed for many years. For many years, ladies and gentlemen. They were commissioned by Godfrey, or Geoffrey de Bouillon, who was the first king of Jerusalem. What do you think about that? Not by the Pope. And they rose to power on that commission. It wasn't until they were extremely powerful and very successful in the field of battle, and very rich, I might add, that they were summoned by the Pope and then commissioned as an order of the Catholic Church. I think the Knights Templar accepted more on a political basis than on any basis of understanding and belief in the Catholic religion. Because it is clear, ladies and gentlemen, in researching the Knights Templar, that they certainly, they certainly were not ladies and gentlemen, practicers of the Christian religion as interpreted by the Catholic Church or any other Christian church, for that matter. They were, in fact, practitioners of the ancient mystery religions. On the Templar-Rosicrucian connection, not long after the suppression of the Templars as an order, some Templars who survived or escaped the persecution formed a society called the Elder Brothers of the Rose Cross. Templar Grand Masters and advanced members of the order would be categorized as higher initiates. They were distinct from other servants of the order, like builders, artisans, men-at-arms, and ancillaries. The elevated station of their leaders had parallels with the Cathars, whose leaders were perfecti, perfect because of moral purity and strictly bound rule. Others were credentes, believers, who were allowed some freedom from higher discipline and who were not yet ready to be elevated. Both Templars and Cathars derived some of their beliefs from contact with the Middle Eastern religious and mystical thought, which played no small part in their final condemnation as heretics and in the control of their overt activity. Differences existed among the mystically minded societies. These are best seen in the main symbols representing their principal aim or character. The Templar Red Cross on a white mantle had a related but different symbolic meaning from the Rosy Cross. A Cather cross was equal branched with a rose at the axis. Rosicrucians, as a group, have never been known to go on military adventures, although individuals may have been combatants. Cathars defended themselves when attacked. The Templars' fame was partly based on their being a fighting machine. It also happened that Templar loyalty to papal authority saw some of them, perhaps unwillingly, take part in the Albigensian Crusade against the Cathars. Yet all three movements were spiritually linked in that day, in that day, 
Let me read that again so that there's no confusion. Yet all three movements were spiritually linked in that they emphasized personal responsibility for one's own spiritual progress and inspired others by their exemplary conduct. And this is an important theme in the Grail Quest. The region of southern France, where Catharism flourished before the final suppression, and particularly the district of Toulouse, enjoyed for a while a freedom of thought and religion. Its people derived countless benefits from the activities of Templars, Cathars, and Rosicrucians. In England, too, there was some cooperation shortly after the Crusades between Templars and Rosicrucians. They built the temple in London, which was to be used as a common ritualistic center. In general, these societies were applying and propagating in their own way their understanding about life and its meaning. They practiced initiatory models for the mystical advancement of their neophytes, and their rites relevant to this were conducted in strict privacy. Since Rosicrucianism is an eclectic, selectively inclusive, and progressive body of wisdom learning, it would have included the best of what the Templars thought and practiced in their private and secret instruction. References to this interesting material is to be found in the archives of the Rosicrucian Order, AMORC, and the affinities between the two orders are considered in the private instruction given to Rosicrucian students. So who were the Grail Guardians? The question is sometimes asked, is the existence of Grail Guardians mythical, or are they historical figures? This leads to the same debate on the nature of the Grail. Is it an object or symbol? There have been attempts to establish a lineage over the centuries, a succession of Grail keepers, an actual rather than a legendary family, a physical bloodline that matched the spiritual one. And for those of you who would like to pursue that, I suggest you read Holy Blood, Holy Grail by Lee Bijant and Lincoln. A path is traced from the time of the Crusades through the Merovingian dynasty to Mary Magdalene and to Jesus. An apparent reference in Wolfram's work to an actual Merovingian ruler of a principality in the south of France is referenced for supporting evidence. With Wolfram's reputation as cryptic writer, the opinion is expressed, and I quote, The more one studies him, the more likely it seems that he is referring to an actual group of people, not a mythic or fictionalized family, end quote. By Jean, page 317. The evidence is a bit tenuous, and the conclusions either tend to raise a few eyebrows or thrill others with the connections explored. Cooperation by other research is wanting, meaning non-existent, but we must keep an open mind about this as we take up another line of thought on the identity of the Grail Guardians. In this case, the lineage is not genetic or fictional, but mystical. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, where I tell you the path lies. In this view of the Grail King, our guardian, we must turn to the Christian mystery. The name of Melchizedek, referred to in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, foreshadows Christ in his offering of bread and wine in token of the flesh and blood of his people. He appears to take on the character of a Grail King holding both offices of priest and temporal ruler. One who is without father or mother or genealogy, and continues a priest forever. Jesus Christ is called a priest in the succession of Melchizedek by right of sacrifice. There is no physical bloodline here, ladies and gentlemen, but an implication that the Grail King could only be a successor to the Melchizedek Christ lineage carried on, as we have seen by Joseph of Arimathea into the future. 
the original chalice, or grail, or its symbolic equivalent, and its protectors on earth, were humanity's heritage from the time we acquired a religious or mystical consciousness. Now this embodiment of the perfect grail king does not sit well with some conceptions of the grail romances about the grail king. In the stories, he appears as the ailing Fisher King, whose incurable wound was caused by some moral lapse. This lapse is explained as sexual indiscretion, or by the implication of original sin, or simply as illustrative of the fall and the need for redemption. Whatever the case may be, both king and kingdom had to suffer indefinitely or until some successor replaced the old king. Recognize that theme? This is a problem we face when myths are mixed, and it occurred in the consciousness of medieval man when pagan beliefs, that is Celtic, had to come to some accommodation with Christianity. We need not enter into the debate here as to whether the biblical story is so much fact and so much myth. The mythical aspect of the Melchizedek succession supports a linear movement in human origins and destiny from the creation, the fall, experience on earth, and the final perfect outcome on Judgment Day. The Grail King myth, however, represents a cyclic Celtic view of events. What was observable in nature and the universe corresponded with events in the lives of men. Birth, growth and decline, death and regeneration, or, if you wish, reincarnation. Once the Melchizedek story and its implications entered into the consciousness of medieval man, it was represented not in the Grail Romance, but in stone. One of the countless messages that the Cathedral of Chartres has passed on to posterity is the status of Melchizedek. It stands alongside the biblical and historical figures flanking the portals of the cathedral. He is there. He is there holding a cup in which there is a smooth stone as incorporating a double concept. The two symbols of chalice and precious stone, mentioned separately in the romances, were here united as if to permanently set the myth in a medium even more enduring than oral or written tradition. Forever are the two truths represented, the chalice as a source and maintainer of life, and the precious stone as the light of cosmic wisdom. And so we have found in the Melchizedek statue a point of meditation on the nature on man's place in the universe. The grail guardian here is the perfect man. Remember what I've taught you, ladies and gentlemen? He echoes it right here. And this is a highly degreed adept of the Rosicrucian order. Listen to me very carefully. The grail guardian here is the perfect man, the priest king, the Christ king, a composite of Arthur and Merlin, a Hermes Trigmagistos, one who has attained office by being of two worlds, having one foot in heaven and the other on earth, or living this life in a moment of time as if the two worlds were one. This is surely the concept of the Grail Guardians in the imagery of Grail mythology. Namely, to further the idea of celestial man. <clears throat> I don't know if I'm going to make it for this whole two hours, so you guys better be ready to do a lot of talking. <clears throat> In fact, you'll have to excuse me for just a second. I had to turn down the mic pot in order to uh, have a little coughing fit here. Well, this is the uh, last of it, ladies and gentlemen. 
every human being must be elevated through trial and initiation to the status of the priest king, the union of the spiritual and temporal, the representation of divinity in the manifested universe in all its glory. The lineage of this elite may be marked out at the ideal or archetypal level, but no one is excluded from attaining this ideal since it requires individual will and effort in the first place and then initiation into the highest degree of grail chivalry. Now in case you didn't understand what I just told you, it is the realization of the promise of Satan to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden that they were being held prisoner by an unjust, vindictive God in the bonds of ignorance, the chains of ignorance. And that they should, they should eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, even though God had forbidden them to do it, because according to Satan, God was forbidding them, forbidding them their destiny. And that by eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they too would become as gods and would not, as God told them they would, surely die. Remember that? Well, listen to this again. Listen to this again. Every human being must be elevated through trial and initiation to the status of the priest king the union of the spiritual and temporal, the representation of divinity in the manifested universe in all its glory. In other words, to become as God. The lineage of this elite, the lineage of this elite may be marked out at the ideal our archetypal level. But no one is excluded from attaining this ideal since it requires individual will and effort in the first place and then initiation into the highest degree of grail chivalry. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, as I have been teaching you for all these years, here is another confirmation from the mouth of a highly degreed member of the Fraternitas Rosi Cruci, printed in the Rosicrucian Digest, Volume 74, Issue Number 2, 1996, the admission that their religion is the Luciferian philosophy, exactly as Albert Pike said himself in his book, Morals and Dogma, back in the 1800s, in the middle of the 1800s, when he wrote it. And with that, let us uh, put you in a thoughtful mood to digest what you have just heard.
once again, I have given you confirmation, once again, of the real secret behind the lodge door. Practiced in the temple without windows. By the brotherhood. No matter what name you tack on to that brotherhood, at the highest levels, it's always the same. Always. Never changed. And it never will. It is the concept that because man is the only creature ever given the ability to think or reason that the collective mind of man is in fact the mind of God. And uh, that man, through the use of his intellect and his good works, will become as gods and will not surely die. And they are feverishly working in laboratories to unlock the secret of aging, the genetic code of the human animal, in order that a perfect race of men may be created who will then live forever. How about that? If you don't believe me, if you live long enough, you're going to find out that I'm right. The number is 520-333-4578, and the phones are open. The phones are going to be open for the rest of the broadcast, and I hope that the audience will talk, um, will do most of the talking so that, uh, <clears throat> so that my uh, voice will last for the remainder of this broadcast, hopefully. So you're free to uh, discuss whatever you wish. You can discuss what you just heard, or you can talk about current events. You can talk about the impeachment of the president. You can talk about the weather. I don't care what you talk about as long as you talk. 520-333-4578 is the number. Again, I want to remind all of you that last Thursday night's broadcast was a rerun. For those of you who thought that it was live, it was a rerun. Good evening. You're on the air. Well, hello, Mr. Cooper. Uh, sure, it's my pleasure. Uh, I used to listen to you when you were on a station that uh, was playing broadcast out of Central California, and that's where I'm calling from. And Well, a couple nights after Christmas, I was tuning the dial and heard them old Marshall Law Sirens on 7.415. Boy, was I a happy camper. <laughs> well, glad to have you back. Okay. Well, you know, I don't know what how... Just wanted to throw something out here for people who might be new to you and uh, listen, your listening audience. I'm kind of nervous here, so I'm... Well, take a deep breath and settle down. You're amongst friends here. Okay, well, anyway, a long time ago, well, three, four years ago, when I used to listen to you on that other station that broadcast on FM, uh, one night you threw out a, a date of a newspaper ad. It's Thursday, December 15th, 1960, about the breakdown of civilization when they're... Uh, uh, confronted with superior technology and, and things like that out of the New York Times. And, uh, you know, I went down library the day I was trying to find something else, but I stopped at the reference. And sure enough, well, I brought that article, and I just wanted to thank you so much because I've learned, you know, more from you than listening to any of the many other radio people that I listen to, you know, and... Uh, well, you know, some people don't don't feel that way. Some people think that listening to me is a complete waste of time. <laughs> well, I try to t make my family aware of the peril that we're in, and they, you know, that that old, you know, I don't know, them people on the TV, and tonight there's a basketball game on, you know, they just can't get out of that mode, so. Yeah, the uh, the Emperor's Coliseum, the, the, the games. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the emperor created the Colosseum in Rome in order to divert the the uh, thinking of the population from revolution to uh, to uh, uh, hedonistic, pleasurable activity. Well, I understand completely. I you know I, I drive coast to coast in one of them diesel cars out there, and and uh, once in a while I get on my wild horse and start you know letting it go on the CB a little bit and people come at me back like I'm crazy and a nut and all that and I you know sometimes I cop attitude and tell them don't worry about it maybe you'll figure it out when you're standing in a food line someday <laughs> well good for you, you know? 
And uh, you know, one other note today on the front page of USA Today was the article uh, pilot program started in Colorado through the Department of Transportation where truckers can volunteer uh, for training and they'll become, you know, eyes of the police out there on the road. And they, ah, Hitler's brown shirts. Uh, you know, they just, uh, the blurring of the line all the way, you know, if it ain't divide and conquer, it's uh, another method of installing that police state, you know. Well, that is divide and conquer. It also instills terror in everyone because you'll never know which trucker you're sitting uh, at a table with in a truck stop is, is one of the Gestapo's informants. Yeah, there you go. And, you know, I, I have my, well, I, I tell my dad he don't want to wake up. You know, my mind is a little polluted than most people, but, you know, the double speak for I'm just a little more aware and awake. But, you know, I <laughs> some of these guys are so worried about their logbooks, you know, and they can't see that the government's controlling them and how they provide for their family and <laughs> than that, you know. Yeah. So, well, anyway, I tell you what, I'm so glad. The last I had heard, you was on the, I believe someone told me, the RMI out of Miami, and I never could reach you out here in the Central Valley, California, but uh, I got a 60-foot-long wire out there in the tree, so you're, you're coming in about a S5, S4 on my 818, okay? Well, good for you. So, thank you very much for all that you've done. And, you're, you're welcome. Uh, keep up the good work. I'll be listening. Okay, thank you for calling. Thank you for talking a lot, too. <laughs> oh, no problem. I'm going to get back out there and listen to your other callers. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. 520-333-4578 is the number. Phones are open, and uh, you can uh, talk about anything that's on your mind. I don't care. Just talk. <laughs> Call in and talk, whoever you are. For those of you who have not yet received your uh, your packet of information from American Longevity on Dr. Wallach's recommendations on how you can improve your own personal health, uh, you need to call 1-888-403-2405. That's 1-888-403-2405. Good evening. You're on the air. All right, can I get you to talk a lot louder, please? Sure, how are you doing? Oh, that's much better. Doing fine. Well, that's good. Uh, well, I'm talking an hour and a half. And uh, you're new about uh, S, uh, oh, S7 or so in uh, Iowa. Well, that's good. So um, uh, what do you have to say about these uh, Rosicrucians? What do I have to say about them? Yeah. I don't understand what you mean. The purpose of the broadcast, the hour of the time, is to wake up the people who don't understand what's really going on. Well, what's really going on? Well, you'll have to listen to this broadcast. Well, over. I don't listen to the broadcast, and I don't understand what's going on. You, you're telling me this, and you're telling me that, and what one group leaves, and what the other group leaves. And you don't think that that means anything? Well, I don't know what you leave. I don't know what anybody else leaves, and I don't know what the, the importance of the whole broadcast is. Frankly. Well, if you don't if you don't know what anyone believes, then you should listen to try to determine, and you should go and find the necessary references and books to check it out to make sure it's true because it does make a tremendously big difference. Well, uh, yeah, I guess so. Cause I tell you something, nobody's calling you except me. Pardon? I don't know what this is all about. And you're not telling me what it's all about, and I'm not going to find out what it's all about. Well, you know why? Because you haven't got the brains to stuff up a gnat's ass that would roll around like a BB in a box car. You don't have the capacity well, so to think. Yeah. Good night. Yeah. <laughs> Every once in a while, ladies and gentlemen, we get one of these idiots who doesn't have any intelligence, no brains, no gray matter whatsoever, and is just calling not to contribute, not to learn, but to disrupt. And uh, we are not interested in those kinds of people whatsoever. This is not the Art Bell Show. So if you believe it's the Art Bell Show, then what you need to do is just take a deep breath and uh, go talk to Art Bell. We don't play those kinds of games here, like uh, some others do. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, Bill. This is Jean calling from California. Hi, Jean. How are you? Fine, fine. 
and I've been following your show, and it's just wonderful. I'm getting pretty good reception out here. But I want to share something with you. I think I told you at the last conference that I have never seen one of your books in a used bookstore. Really? And um, so uh, this weekend I was up at a show up in uh, Pasadena, and they have, it was a health and fitness show, and they have a vendor that comes in and brings a lot of uh, new and used books. And one lady was sitting there, she was holding her book, and it was a hardback copy. Oh, one of the... Uh Original. One of the original 500 collectors signed a numbered edition. No, I didn't know it was it was that limited, or I would have bought it. But you had an inscription in there, and it and it said something about thank you thanking somebody. There was not a name, but it was thanking somebody for their support during these trying times. Uh huh. And so the lady was asking the book vendor underneath your your uh, signature was 032. So she was saying to the vendor, she says, I wonder what this means. And um, That was book number 32 of 500, which makes it extremely valuable. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. Well, anyway, he said it was a 33rd, that you were a 32nd degree Mason. No. No, that was book number 32 of a signed and numbered limited edition of only 500 hardback copies of Behold a Pale Horse in the entire world. So that was copy number 32. It was also the, the first edition. I feel real bad I didn't buy that book. <laughs> what did they want for it? They wanted $25 for it. Oh, my God, that's a steal. Yeah, and, um, you know, after I left on my way home, I thought, why? Well, see, if they had known that was copy number 32 of a limited edition of 500, uh, you, you wouldn't have got it for $25, I guarantee you. Okay, why they said that, uh, well, uh, on the front of the book it said signed, and that, that's basically why they had uh, that much on it, well, it was because of your signature. But when they said that somebody put it was like uh, that you were 32nd degree Mason, it was, the date on it was 3391, and I said, no, this is not Bill's particular signature, because I said, look at the threes, they're different. Um, I didn't know what that meant, but anyway, I want you to know I was defending you down there. Oh, well, you don't need to defend me from ignorant people. I know, but you know... Um, ignorant people get their own reward. Either they stop being ignorant and they begin to learn the truth about the world, mm -hmm. uh, or, or they continue to be ignorant and they reap the rewards of their ignorance. Well, anyway, it was the first time for me after eight years of hunting all these bookstores, I have never seen a, you know, a copy of your book, you know, secondhand there. And um, it was the first time. Listen, uh, yeah, I thank Annie for the book that she gave me on Dr. Wallace. I read it one night, and I really appreciate it. I'm going to be sending her some things. Uh, you, you read that whole book in one night? Yeah, well, I had already read his first book. I oh. had that here. Uh -huh. So anyway, you know, some of the things I just sort of skimmed through. But anyway, I did enjoy it. It's very beneficial. And something that might help you, which you have, is, is for laryngitis with the essential oils is lavender or respiratory as eucalyptus and lemon. Mm -hmm. So anyway, well, listen, God bless you. I pray for you every night. Well, thank you, Jean. <laughs> best to all the family, and I'll be writing soon. So nice to hear from you. Well, I love you all. Well, we love you, too. Bye now. Good night. Thanks for calling. 520-333-4570. Boy, I would have really been in trouble had that been copy number 33. Can you imagine copy number 33? Ooh, boy, what would they have said then? Good evening, you're on the air. Good evening, Bill. This is Glenn. Hi, Glenn. How are you? I'd like to answer that man that did not know what the purpose of the broadcast is. The purpose of the broadcast is the world's on fire, and this is kind of a fireman's muster. Hey, everybody, come out and put it out. Yeah, but the primary, that's, that's good, but the primary uh, mission really is to, is to acquaint people with knowledge that they never had before and, uh, and uh, send them out to, to make sure that it's right. And if it's not right, prove it wrong and we'll correct it. They can't be a fireman if they, if they don't know there's a fire, <laughs> if you know what I mean. I know what the, uh, Dan Richard and I were just talking about that kind of thing today. There's a lot of people that prove they know anything at all. They just shut their mind down. I said, that's because it's too scary. Yeah. They don't want to look. I said, that's because as they know anything at all, it's too scary. And they shut their, shut their eyes to it. Yeah, the, the normal reaction to the truth 
is to ignore it with the thought that if I don't look at it, if I don't pay any attention to it, and if I don't, uh, if, if I don't uh, get involved in it, it'll go away. Well, and, and we all know that that's not going to happen. Work. I had a fire in my house once. It didn't go away just because I ignored it. No, it certainly won't. <laughs> no, it won't. Any, anything else, Lynn? No, no, that was all I had to say. Uh, thank you for letting me say it. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for calling. I appreciate it. To hear from you. I haven't been able to get you since you left the other station, which was years ago. And I got an old antique radio out of the basement that had shortwave on it, and I finally found it. It is so good to hear from you. I remember Pooh. I remember when Alice was born. I remember it all. Are you the Are you the same guy that called earlier? No. Well, he said he was the only one that called. I was wondering how he made his voice sound like Gene. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So I remember way back when you were on the document of 7277. Yes. And I went to a... Boy, that was years ago. Yeah, that was years ago. But anyway, I went to a government depository to find the book, or to find the House Resolution. Uh-huh. And they had volume 1, 2, 3, and it went down to 10. Uh, and the volume that it was in was gone. Yeah, well, that happens a lot. They don't want people to know what's happening. In fact, you would be amazed at how many significant books are disappearing from the libraries in this country. Yes, sir. And nobody knows where they're going. I really do. I know that for an absolute fact. Yeah, all the old law books, anything concerning the Constitution, uh, anything concerning the true history uh, of this country, uh, all things uh, written uh, about uh, the differences between a republic and democracy and socialism and communism and all of those things disappear. Well, I am really glad to be picking you up again, Mr. And, Cooper. Well, I'm so happy to have you back. Let me tell you a little story about my grandfather. Okay. My grandfather was a mason for years and years and years. And there was a man that came and talked to him one day. And he never was the same. He was very upset. They called Mama. Mama went to see him and all this. And evidently, the man had given him a copy of Morals and Dogma. And he must have read the book. Granddad was a very red man. Uh -huh. And I still have the copy, but Granddad was never the same after he read that book. And he was on up in the age then. Uh -huh. But, it, you know, his health just went. And he never said anything about it, huh? No, he never said a word. It must have upset him quite a bit. Quite a bit. It really did. It upset him a great deal. Well, see, if, if you don't understand the, the symbolic language, then you could read morals and dogma and really not understand what Pike is saying. But if you understand that symbolic language, which he, if he had been a Freemason for many years, he must have understood it, then, uh, then it's very clear uh, what the truth is that Albert Pike is imparting to his uh, brothers of the lodge in morals and dogma, and the truth is uh, is quite disconcerting. Well, I know he never was quite the same after that. Yeah, Mr. Cooper, I am so glad to be able to pick you up again. Really, I'm very honored to have your station and coming back into my house. Well, I thank you very much for that's a great compliment, and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. You're welcome. Bye. Five two zero. Three 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 four five seven eight. Um, by the way, sorry, Randy. <laughs> You're listening to WBCQ Monticello, Maine, USA. This is the hour of the time. I'm William Cooper. Good evening. You're on the air. Oh, uh, good evening, Bill. This is Greg from Texas. Hi, Greg. I'm listening to you on a uh, S53A model from the Halicrafters Company. Oh, that's an old one, isn't it? Yeah. I keep those tubes cool, though. Yeah, my dad used to have one like that when I was a, just a young whippersnapper. Used to sit on the cabinet in the kitchen. We'd all sit around the table and listen to uh, short waves some nights. What's great about it, it's got a band spread on it, so you can really uh, fine-tune there. Uh-huh. So I'm battling your signal with, uh, I think, Voice of America and some... Uh, some Spanish uh, broadcast, but I can get in between them. Yeah, well, the Spanish broadcast we know about. Voice of America is not supposed to come on uh, until the, uh, the the top of the next hour. Okay, well, maybe it's not them, but I've heard them just uh, basically walk over your signal. Yeah, they they do that. 
But I, I, I'm, I'm going to give you a better antenna. I think I can do do okay with that. Okay. I want to ask you something. Uh, I was looking on your uh, on the website today. Yeah. Your public forum. Uh huh. Which uh, I know you have to put up with a lot of BS on there, but I, you know. Oh, let me tell you something. Every day I fight with myself about just taking that thing right off the the server. Well, I mean, from my point of view, it's a really good thing for me because it just um, it's a good exchange of information, but. Uh, you know, some of the stuff on there, it, you know. Well, it is for some people, but unfortunately, most of them are sheeple. Yeah. And they just get on there and just rant and rave and, and uh, have their religious arguments and, and uh, blame but, people. What I mean is I can uh, put something on there. Like I put something there on there the other day, and I got a response back from, uh, you know, some very intelligent people on there. And they mentioned that you had done a show on this book that I was uh, trying to get. And it was uh, by Michael A. Hoffman II. Um, Psychopolitics? Uh, no, it was Secret Society and Psychological Warfare. Oh, okay. Secret Society and Psychological Warfare, yeah. You did I, a show on that? Well, I did two shows on it. I was doing I was doing a series. And I used to do series. And sometimes I would announce in the beginning where the information came from. Sometimes I would do the series. And at the end, just to keep people guessing and, and uh, interested so that they wouldn't run off and, and uh, get the book and... and you know, short circuit the broadcast, right. then I would tell them at the end. Well, this was right around the time of the Oklahoma City bombing, I believe, and, and I did two shows uh, on it and wasn't even near finished with the series, and um, so it was never attributed to the proper source, okay. uh, which it, you know, all everything I always do, I always attribute to the source and the author and all that kind of, but that's the only two tapes that never were. <laughs> and it's simply because we never finished it, just never finished it. Are, are those tapes available? Uh, yeah, if you'll send one dollar with a self-addressed stamped envelope with 75 cents postage on it, sure. uh, we'll send you off a whole tape. catalog of everything that we've got and you can figure out what it is that you want. How far does your tape list go back? Uh, I really don't know. Annie handles all of that stuff. But, you know, we retire the masters after a while. So some, a lot of the early broadcasts are not available. Yeah. It's simply because we have to retire the masters uh, so that they'll be there for, for history uh, or, or they'll just get worn out and there will be no record of the broadcast. Okay, sure. Because yeah, I, I remember the first show I listened to you was in uh, 1992, somewhere in the... Uh... Yeah, in fact, our first broadcast was May the 4th, 1992, just two days before my birthday. Uh, and uh, I was doing it on videotape and sending it to uh, Scott Becker for the Becker Satellite Network in Kansas. And Scott was sending it to Dallas, Texas, and Dallas was uh, uploading it to a satellite... <laughs> And I thought nobody was listening, and then all of a sudden I got all of these letters from all over the world, and it was just incredible. And the rest is history. Well, I can remember calling and, and talking to Stan Barrington. Yeah. Is, is, how's Stan? Is he still around? I don't know. Stan retired, and I don't know where Stan and, uh, and his wife are. And now we haven't heard from them in quite a while. Okay. Well, uh, before I take up too much time, there's a couple other subjects I wanted to, to, to run by you. Uh, there's a book you turned me on to, well, at least through your um, series on the ADL. Uh -huh. uh, I got through my local library. I live in, I don't live in that big of a town, but the, I got to tell people the interlibrary loan is something that everybody needs to, to use. It's amazing. Yes, I've covered that on my broadcast on many occasions. Uh, it, it is an excellent uh, way to get uh, books that are not in your library and may not even be in your state. You can get them, any book in the nation, that's in a library through the Interlibrary Loan Program. Yeah, well, I, um, a couple of weeks ago I went and <coughs> got Dope Incorporated. That was uh, that was in your ADL expose. Yes. By the uh, editor of the Intelligence Executive Intelligence Review. Yes, that'll open your eyes. Yeah, in a couple of days I got it. I'm halfway through it. It's uh, it, that's a it's a really good book. It's uh, of course I don't agree with every all their viewpoints, but uh, yeah, their documentation on the international banking system and how they are dope incorporated. Yeah, you have to uh, you have to watch out for their political bent. Oh, you sure do. But their research is impeccable. Their research is very good. Of course, their views is you know they they, they want to lock up anybody that doesn't agree with them. But uh, well, sure. <laughs> another thing, just, uh, just like almost everybody else. <laughs> yeah, another thing that I have I've got sitting in my VCR, but I was waiting till after your show is, and I'm sure you've seen it. They have uh, reissued a uh, I guess a digitally enhanced version of the Zapruder film. 
and it's at local video stores now. Let me uh, let me uh, caution you. There is only one one good source of the original analog version of the Zap Ruder film, and that's through us. Well, I have it. Yeah, we're the only source of the actual second generation copy right off the first generation we right. paid we paid sixteen thousand dollars for it through the through uh, uh my contacts to get an actual copy on 35 millimeter film off the original eight millimeter film it is intact it is every single frame exactly as exists on the on the uh original zap Ruder eight millimeter film it is has not been digitized. It has not been tampered with by us at all whatsoever. Anything that you ever get that's digitized, you cannot use as proof of anything. Uh, because if you'll bring me anything that's digitized, I'll put it on my computer and I'll change it, and, and you'll never be able to know that it's been changed. I can do anything I want to a digitized copy right. of anything that you have that's digitized. Right. And you can tell with the computer that it's been digitized, can't you? You can tell on the TV. It just looks good well, enough. But my point is, uh, I, I had I got your video, The Sacrifice King, in, uh -huh. in like '93. Yeah, I've shown it to many people, caused a buzz you know, in my circle of friends. Uh, it's one of their favorite videos. They want to borrow, but I don't let anybody borrow videos anymore. I found that's not a good thing. Well, I wouldn't let that out of my hands no, if no, I were you. If I'm going to show it, I have to be there. Well, the master is is destroyed. There is no there. There can never be any more copies of that. So, oh, really? Yeah, there are very few existing anywhere. What happened to the masters? Well, they wear out after. They wear out. Okay. After right. a while, they wear out and they're no good. Okay. Okay. Well, well, I just got this just to you know just to see what uh, what their you know what the angle is on this thing. And of course, they uh, the, I watched ten seconds of it before your show came on, and they mentioned how they had the original Zapruder film. That's what they <laughs> called it. And you know, and I'm just waiting. Well, the only way that you, that you'll ever know is if you get a copy of the one that we have. Yes and put it side by side theirs and make sure that it's exactly the same then you'll know that they're they're that, that, that they didn't change it when they digitized it well i have a feeling that they did change it that's why i want to watch it i have too and i'm just waiting to get my hands on a copy i haven't seen any source yet where i can get a copy but it's, it's, it's probably at your local video store because it's a new release they have it with the new releases and they, you know it's in a fancy box and everything well you know we live way out in rural america where okay. Where we have a couple of video stores, but they don't, they're not like, uh, what, what do you call the, the Blockbuster, big, and, all Blockbuster and all those things, you know. They're just little, little, uh, pop and mom places and, and, uh, they, they carry new releases and, and sometimes they have an awful lot of, uh, of the best of the old releases, but they don't, you know, carry everything like you can get in a big city. Yeah. Well, just knowing what I know from your research and having that, you know, your, uh, your, uh, videotape on, on the uh, Kennedy assassination. I just, you know, I just want to see what, what the angle is on this. I can already imagine. Um, two more things real quick. Uh, you're needing donations for the uh, television project. Yeah, that's one thing I was going to talk about. Well, do you accept uh, coins? Sure. Gold or silver coins? Yes, we do. Okay, I was thinking about thinking about doing that for you. In fact, uh, some people have sent us some gold and silver coins. Okay. We just got some silver from uh, Stephen Malone who sent us that uh, CD, the music CD. And by the way, those of you who have ordered the music CD, uh, Annie's going to send them out tomorrow for you. Um, What's the music CD? Uh, Stephen Malone, in order to help us with our uh, with, with what we're doing here, uh, he, he he's a musician, <laughs> and he made a CD. Uh, and he wrote the music and he played all the instruments and he uh, mixed them together and he made the CD and it's just absolutely beautiful music. I played it one night. Okay. And, uh, Is that available in the package when you send for tapes and things like that? I don't know if Annie's got that in there or not. It's an on-air offer. If you want a, co a tape, a cassette, stereo copy, uh, it's $10. And he just signed his copyright over to us for one year so that we can, that, that'll help our TV, uh, uh, project. That's a good deal. One last thing, when you were talking to another caller, you mentioned how books and things are disappearing from libraries. Oh, yes. Um, there's something in, uh, there's a university here in, uh, near, well, it's in Beaumont, Texas, near where I live. Mm -hmm. It's Lamar University. They have a rare uh, sort of book section on the seventh floor. 
it's a small little room. And I was looking on the card catalog one time. Uh, you know, I just put in Illuminati just to see what would happen. And of course, there was there were two entries under Illuminati. One of the books is uh, in Spanish, and it's that name I can't. It's like Alumbrados or something. Ilumbra like that. Ilumbrados. Yes. Well, that's a book about them, but it's in Spanish, which you know I don't read Spanish. But they had a document from 1896 or 1898 the title of it was <laughs> The Clintonian Faction of the Illuminati <laughs> it was about uh, yeah it's funny Clintonian it was about that Governor DeWitt Clinton in New York yes and how he was involved with the Illuminati and I can't remember who wrote it but I I, I had some time one time when I was taking some classes during the summer to, to read it and what it is it looks like it, it was bound at one time but it's just pages now they're in plastic yeah but it's very illuminating if you could, you know. <laughs> I, was, I was asking if I could get a copy of it. No pun intended, huh? <laughs> no pun intended. I'm going to try to get a copy of it, though. Uh, well, you I don't know. It may not be there when I go back. Well, you, then you should get back there as quickly as you possibly can. I think I am. Because those things are, are very important. Yeah. Well, I'm going to try to do that. Hearing that they're, they're, they're disappearing, I'm going to be going back there very soon. Oh, yeah, and a lot of libraries now, uh, for some reason, listen to how dumb this is. This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Libraries are taking old books off the shelf, and they're either destroying them or selling them for five or ten cents on the dollar because old books aren't good for libraries. Yeah. Well, you know what? Because of that, at this library, at this university, I've got me a collection, a great collection of books. I was getting hardcovers for a dollar. Yeah, but you know what? But, but, but they're disappearing because I didn't di buy all They're them. disappearing, and people throw them away. They don't know the value of them, and when they die, their children come to, to you know, to, to settle the estate, and they don't want those old books, so they throw them away. So the, the sum total written in books for hundreds and hundreds of years by the human race is slowly being discarded into the trash cans. It's the most incredible thing I've ever heard of in my entire life. And the excuse is that people don't like to read old books, and that's the biggest bunch of BS I've ever heard in my life. Sounds like Nazi Germany. Boy, it, it sounds like an excuse to burn books, is what it sounds like yeah. to me. Well, um, I've got me a government book from 1919. That's, that's really good. Yeah, and the older the books, the more truth you will find in them, and that's what they don't want us to see. Well, your show turned me on to that concept. Uh, and anytime, anything old, uh, I, tr I try to peruse and look through and keep. Yeah, we, we, we did a, a great service to uh, use bookstores across this country, i got to tell you that. I bet you did. One more thing I'll just mention with those books. I got me a four-volume History of the World by H.G. Wells. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know he wrote history books. H.G. Wells wrote a lot of things. Uh, there's some other things you should look for, too. He wrote a book called The New World Order. <laughs> I'm write that down. And he wrote that, I believe, in 1940 or 1941. New, do you have that book? Yes, I do. I bet you've got a lot of books. Oh, yes, I do. I have, uh, I have a huge library. Right now, it's all packed away in storage, and it's been in storage since we left St. John's, actually. Yeah. Okay, well, look, uh, I'll let some other people get on here, uh, Bill, but uh, I'm going to order that. Uh, I've got my, uh, I sent my thing in for the uh, for Dr. Wallach's uh, to be a preferred customer, and I'm, I just can't wait to get that stuff and try it. Okay. And uh, hopefully I can send you a donation for the television project. Oh, I hope so, because uh, we're, we're, you know, well, I'm going to talk about that. Okay. So just listen. All right. <laughs> Thanks for calling. Uh the number is 520-333-4578. I want to talk about the television project because for so long we weren't getting any donations at all. And then I did my famous broadcast where I called you to task for that and people started sending donations. Now let me tell you what we've got so far. We've got $5,040. $5,040. We've broken the magic number, ladies and gentlemen. We now need less than 10000 Remember, we started out needing $15,000. We needed $15,000. Thanks to those of you who really care, who want to see us succeed, we now have $5,040.02 to be exact. So now, 
We just need about $9,060. Now, for those of you who have been sitting back thinking that, you know, we're going to get the money that we need and you're not going to have to contribute, you're wrong. We need the help of all of you. See, even they, $15,000 sounds like a lot of money to the average man, but it's not. It's nothing today. And that's the truth. It really is nothing. If all of you would right now tonight send a donation to this television project, within the end of this week, we could have the total amount that we need and make it a reality. It's that easy. We've already knocked down $5,040. Thank you, all of those of you who have contributed that amount of money. Good evening. You're on the air. Hello? Well, I guess he couldn't wait. 520-333-4578 is the magic number. So everybody listening out there, reach down deep inside your soul and figure out whether or not you want us to succeed. If you do, send us a donation and send us the most that you can possibly afford. If you don't want us to succeed, then stop listening to this broadcast, okay? Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, this is uh, Daniel from Colorado. Hi, Daniel. And uh, I've, I've enjoyed listening to your program for years, but I was, you know, I was intrigued to hear you talking about the library books, and I can give you an eyewitness. Uh, first, uh, could, you, could you talk louder, please? Yes, I'll try. Uh, I can give you an eyewitness on something that was happening with the library books. I used to work for the State Library in Vermont in the early 70s, and they had a regional library system that actually the, the regional librarians, there were five re regional librarians, and we would go into local town libraries and do what we call weeding, which is to take out all the old books. Yeah. And I, it was my job, and I thought it was awfully stupid at the time, but, and I didn't, but I was, my, it was my job to make sure that none of those books got into anybody's hands, but they were all destroyed. Yeah, who makes decisions like that? Who in the world is it that says that just because a book is old, it doesn't contain anything valuable? Well, it's a conspiracy. They were all taught this in library school. This is amazing. And so they just went well, through all the little libraries in Vermont that had tremendous, beautiful books. And if it was older than 20 years old or something like that, uh, automatically out it would go. And I salvaged as many as I could, but I sent a lot of them before I quite realized what a terrible thing it was. It was my job to, to throw them into the trash heap compactor. Oh, my God. It, it, it just about made me sick. I collected a few of them, but... But I didn't really realize some of the things that to look for the kind of books. But these libraries, I went through with the librarians through, through numerous town libraries. And the kind of things we were weeding out were exactly the kind of books we'd be interested in. Yes. Yeah. That, that I've discovered. Okay. I thought I'd just throw that in there. Well, I really appreciate that. But, you know, hearing that, even though I know it's happening, hearing it from somebody else like a stab through my heart. Well, it is terrible. Oh, I, I am one of the, the biggest book lovers that you could possibly imagine. And I realized, I realized at, a, at an early age, the other children used to go out and, and do things, and I would always be at the library. Uh, I learned to read at a very early age, and I loved the library. I just loved it. I, I was reading books that, that most people never read in their lifetime when I was a teenager. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that, no. um, you know, that, 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 that there's anything good or bad about that. I, my, my first exposure to the Holy Grail was from a box of old books I found in the attic. Yeah. But the, I, I learned that the sum total of all of the knowledge of the entire human race is in books. Well, there's a certain, there's a certain secret order and maybe more than one that has a goal to rewrite history. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, they that do. That's part of it. It's not by accident. They do it through education. And, and the, you can check and be sure that there's high, high Illuminati degrees in all the library schools. Yep, well, I, I understand that, yes. Yeah. Anyway, th thanks, for, uh, thanks for taking my call. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for your, for your uh, information there. God bless.
520-333-4578. Let me give you the address, folks, so that you can send the donation so that we can get this TV funded, this TV project funded, and, and get it on the way. We've got to get this going, folks. And uh, not only do we have to get $6,000 to pay back uh, Rick and Barbara for their loan, but we have to get the rest of the money for the rest of the equipment that we need, a total of $15,000. Right now, we've got $5,040.02, and uh, we need $9,060. We need $9,000, and uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> $9,960 is is what we need so uh please you know look down in your heart see if you want this to succeed if you do uh, don't wait for somebody else to make it come to pass you make it come to pass tonight you sit down and you send us a donation in tomorrow's mail and we can have this funded and we can be working on it to make it real by the end of this week that's how easy it is. Hey, I know a lot of you out there were sitting around thinking, oh, man, this is so much money. It's not. When you get up off your butts and contribute, it's not. And it will happen. Good evening. You're on the air. Hello, Bill. I'll give you the address right after this call. Yes, sir. Yeah, Bill. Uh, for the guy who was wondering, wondering what this is all about, this show, yeah. um, I can attempt an answer. Well, there's a well, out there. well, you know, don't even do it because he wasn't really looking for an answer. I can always tell when somebody's serious or when they're not. He wasn't looking for an answer. Well, we were, we were all people at one time. What what he was trying to do was say that that, that this show is not worth anything, and that uh, he was the only one that called. And he was a disruptor. He wasn't interested in the answer to that question. I can assure you of that. But, but for anyone who is, uh, they should understand that in order to understand the enemy. We have to, uh, like you have made the point many, many times that uh, it may not, you may not care about the beliefs of those in the, uh, for lack of a better term, Illuminati or the word, but it behooves us to understand their beliefs, no matter how wacky they are, because to understand them, it's, it's like, uh, like a police detective trying to figure out a serial killer. Sure. Uh, and, and have to get into the mind of that serial killer and uh, to better uh, afford them, uh, or smart the, the killer, and uh, they are killers, <laughs> the, uh, the dual order schemers. Oh, yes, they are. But uh, as far as books, I know I was just reading uh, uh, the, the big literary group that did a survey, uh, what was the most meaningful book uh, uh, to you, and uh, number one was the Bible, you know what number two was? It was a book written that uh, is secretly about the Illuminati's plans in this book of so-called fiction. And the book was written by a woman who uh, apparently, as I understand, was the mistress of Philip Rothschild, Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand. The book Atlas Shrugged. Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged. The second most important book uh, to uh, people. Yeah, I, I saw that poll also. Yeah, the Bible was number one, and number two was Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Right. Now, uh, you said that it's... it's uh, it's the plan um, in in the book. Yes. Then would you would you tell us what that is? Well, uh, there's different points. Uh, I was watching a video by uh, a gentleman named Al Neal, which you can get from the uh, the Prophecy Club, and he was pointing out different passages of the book uh, and uh, how it well how it really pertains to Mr. Mr. Rothschild's uh, ideas that she supposedly got from him. Uh, she was supposedly his mistress. You know what? I don't subscribe to that. And uh, I don't see a plan in that book other than how to set yourself free from from the power. It shows how powerful structures of government and corporations strangle uh, of the creativity and the freedom of, of, um, of anyone who's trying to work within that system. You, you've read the book, right? You know what I'm talking about? Not all the way through. I've, I've, I I looked at the look at passages that he was pointing out. You know, it was a thick book that I haven't got. I got some. Uh -huh. But uh, anyway, it's about the skull and bones uh, thing. Did you notice the, that on the T-shirt of Art and Bell? Yeah, I saw that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's 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 having fun. Uh, yeah. He's having fun. That's an old symbol of Freemasonry. And it's not just a symbol of the skull and bones fraternity of Yale. Which is I I know. Yeah, it is. And and if you go to Europe and look at the graves of the Knights Templars, you'll see the skull and bones on their tombstones. Yeah. Let me tell you about this uh, stained glass window up in Greenfield, Mass. is a 100-year-old Masonic lodge 
on Main Street and Greenfield Maps. If you look at the uh, stained glass windows from the street, you see one of them has the cross and the crown, another one has the, it has an outline of a skull. It doesn't have the bones, it doesn't have the eyes, it's just a white outline, and you, you wouldn't even tell from the street that it's a skull, or, or, or certainly not related to a skull and bones. But you go inside the building, it's no longer Masonic Lodge, it's got businesses in it now, and you go into the, uh, the cable TV company there and ask them, and they'll let you go in and take a picture of the inside of the same exact uh, uh, stained glass window, and for some magical reason, the same exact spot where the skull on the outside is just an outline on the inside, appears the bones and the eyes. It's weird. It's a weird effect on the <laughs> But uh, that's yep. in Greenfield Map. Oh, and latest um, Veritas, as I got, you, you, see, you said that uh, Robert Livingston, you called him an American hero because he called on the president to do what he did. And no, because he did the right thing when nobody else in Washington in recent history has ever done the right thing. He, he resigned. He refused to take his seat as the, as the Speaker of the House, and he resigned from Congress uh, effective six months from that day. Yes. He did the right thing, and he called upon Clinton to follow his example. Right. He did it because he, he had, had uh, broken the, the moral code, and he wanted to make it right, and so that's what he did. So no longer be a representative at all? That's correct. Oh, okay. But he didn't really have to do that. I mean, it wasn't like he was a public sweep. I think he did. If he's an honorable man, any honorable man who disgraces his position, you have to make it right. Yeah. And the way you make it right is you resign. I, uh, I called his uh, office today uh, uh, at the Capitol, and I tried to find out, uh, to straighten out whether he was a CFR member or not. They said he was not a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, but the thing is, you look in the 1998 uh, annual report of the CFR, which you can get free from them by calling them up in New York, um, and it says Robert Livingston. Uh, it, it could be a different Robert Livingston, or it might be him. And he may not um, he may not be a member this year. I don't know. And uh, he voted for the anti terrorism anti terrorism legislation, you know. Uh, he voted against the crime bill because it had the Brady law and it they could see uh, they said that he's pro Second Amendment. Uh, he voted against GAP but he but he voted for NAFTA. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> NAFTA is more destructive than GAT ever thought of being. By the way, uh as far as Art Bell um, I heard a guy say in a radio show that uh, his name is Masonic. The art means craft, you know, the craft of Freemasonry. Yeah, and uh, Bell with one L is uh, another name for Lucifer or Baal. Baal, right. Do you think that he was actually born with the name Art Bell? Or is he I have no idea. You would have to ask him. I really don't know. But And, and I'm not saying that that... that uh, metaphor of his name is is uh, meant to be that way. He, he may have been born Art Bell. Yeah, but he has used those occultic symbols on his website. I know oh, he's, uh, he's so deep up to his... He's admitted on his own broadcast to, to being a Freemason. Do you have audio of that? Pardon? Did you keep the audio of that? No. Uh, mm. Okay. Well, I'll let you go. Let's well, it's just like, uh, it's just like Chuck Harder. Chuck Harder has said many times during his broadcast that he believes in socialism. I don't have audio on that either, but I've heard him say it at least four different times. I, I've heard, uh, I've heard uh, uh, Rush Limbaugh say that if anybody ever takes anything that he says during his broadcast seriously, then, the, then they're nuts because he does it just for entertainment, for ratings, and for the money. And that's the only reason he's doing it. Chuck Harder supports the labor cause of socialism, certainly, but I, 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 I know he's definitely against the New World Order. I don't think he has uh, anything to do with that, certainly. Well, uh, be careful there. Read Hegel before you say that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, All right, Bill. Okay. Bye. Take care. 520-333-4578 is the number. Good evening. You're on the air. Uh, yeah. I think there is why I thought the libraries are getting rid of the books is because they think they don't have enough room for them. Well, then why are they getting rid of all of the old books instead of keeping the very best of the old books along with the I, very best of the new? The reason why they are getting rid of the old books is because they they think that they that they don't have enough room for them or they don't want to make room for the books that they need to keep. That's, that's, that, that is my opinion on 
the libraries selling the books or burning them. I feel that if they burn them, then that part of it, their history books, that part of history is gone. You're right. That's so, correct. But let me ask you again. If that's the case, why wouldn't they pick the best of the old along with the best of the new to keep rather than just throwing out all of the old books is what I'm trying to ask you. I, 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 cannot, I cannot answer that question. To tell you the truth, I cannot answer that question. Okay. But... Uh, it would seem to me that if, if, it, if the problem was room, that they would want to keep the best books of all of the different periods of history. Um, but since they're just throwing out the old books, it seems to me that they're trying to get rid of history. And it has nothing to do with room and libraries. Yeah. Um, I, I feel that uh, we need to, we need to uh, uh, read up more on our history than to you know, read all these, you know, fantasy books uh, about things that, you know, never happened. Yeah. I, I feel that we need to pick up a history book or pick up a global studies book and read it from cover to cover. You're right. Uh, that, that's, that's what I feel on, on people that really don't understand our history all too, all too well. They mm -hmm. need to pick up one of those history books and just... To say, to just say, I'm going to read this book and read it from cover to cover. Yeah, well, you're, you're absolutely correct. And most Americans don't have any knowledge whatsoever about the history of this country. And, and people say that, that, uh, that uh, oh, I've learned all my American history. <laughs> but you asked them a question, a, a question that wasn't part of American history. It's, they don't have an answer to it because they didn't pick up a book and read it. Yeah. They didn't pick up a book of American history and read it and find out that this is what happened. This is why it happened. And this is what went on. And this is what occurred what after what that happened. Uh -huh. And this is where we are today. And this is why we, we are here today. You know, that, they, they don't, they don't understand when you ask them a question. What happened, you know, why did the Revolutionary War take place? I, I think half the students don't, uh, just their, their mind goes blank. Yes. Don't know why did the Revolutionary War take place. I remember one memorable moment when I was watching a, uh, one of these uh, television news shows. Not, not the news, but a news show. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took a microphone and walked down the street in New York City and asked people who would stop, uh, what the Bill of Rights, what's the Bill of Rights? And uh, I think out of all of the people that they talked to, um, I remember answers like, isn't that some kind of laundry bill uh, and, and all kinds of weird things, but only one person had any idea of what it is, and, and he knew what it was, but he didn't know what was in it. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for people out there they don't know what the Bill of Rights is it was the first ten amendments that were established in the United States that is how that is how our, con our constitution became what it started with the Bill of Rights and then all the other amendments were added to it yeah. well we thank you for your call. All right, no problem. Appreciate it. You, you, all right, no problem. You have a good day. You too. All right, bye-bye. You, you guys uh, don't realize how correct he was when he said the Constitution started with the Bill of Rights because the states would not accept the Constitution. They would not accept it as it was written, would not approve it or ratify it until the Bill of Rights were completed. The Bill of Rights are not separate from the Constitution. There are not additions to it. They are a part of the Constitution. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, good evening, Bill. Um, you were talking about libraries earlier, uh, well, most of the show, actually. One thing I have noticed, however, is with the new coming millennium fever, there's a lot of books on the millennium, and they're all being put out by various societies, the Rosicrucians, uh, History of the Knights Templar, uh, The Fifth Week by the Jesuits, uh, Unconventional Flying Objects by Paul Hill. I don't know if you've heard about that one. Um, 
anyway, this uh, Rosicrucian notebook, it's, it's pretty interesting. In the introduction, they have a quote by a man by the name of Henry Adamson, Master of Arts of Porth, in his Muses Threnody from 1638, and, and the quote is, For we be brethren of the rosy cross, we have the mason word and second sight. Yeah. Okay, um, and also there, there, there's another uh, thing in here, uh, and this is from a man by the name of Carl Keyswetter. Uh He died in 1895. Uh, his great-grandfather was himself a Rosicrucian, shall have the last word. The possibility can never be ruled out that there were still genuine, genuine Rosicrucians alive at the turn of the present century. However, I hardly imagine that any collection of the order's papers matching that assembled by my grandfather can have survived. And even if, because of the strict rules of the order, the historical material in these documents is meager, that means more space for the practical side of things, and above all, for the countless astounding occult art of the Rosicrucians. Nevertheless, students of the subject are convinced that even today, genuine Rosicrucians are living among us and that they possess remarkable stores of technical knowledge as can be seen in the following excerpt from a piece of research. When the existence of man-flying saucers has been finally admitted, consideration will be given to the fact that in past centuries there were, there were societies like the genuine Rosicrucians on Earth, which regarded the entire solar system as a field of their practical activities. <laughs> we shall now lift the veil as far as may be useful and possible for some of those countless astounding occult secrets as known to the secret scientific societies of Germany. Willy Schroeter was the man's name who wrote that piece. Yeah, well, that's right on the money. It is right on the money. And, you know, you're talking about the libraries, and I, I just got back from the library last week with this armload of books. It was amazing, all the stuff there. And, oh, by the way, the library that I go to has your book in it. Oh, that's great. And it's in the 900 section, like about 936 or 942, and it's always stuck between um, uh, Judaica studies. Huh. I don't know if that's, uh, um, you know, if that's intentional or what, but... Well, they always try to hide my book where people can't find it. Usually they put it in the New Age section, although it has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the New Age. Yeah, but, but this is this was stuck in the Judaica section, and I've been watching this book to see what they do with it. And uh, it was on the uh, on the current list of revolvers, we'll, we'll call it, where uh, you know the, they have a librarian go up and get an armload of books and put them on a special shelf. Uh -huh. And it's quite a substantial section in my library. And uh, well, with with all these nine hundred books, and nobody sees those. They you know they go to the first two or three sessions of book racks, and, and they look at those, and then they never get to the way back. So, you know, I thought there, and I put it on the first shelf in plain view, just, just to, you know... Well, good for you. <laughs> out there one more time. Good for you. So, anyways, uh, and if I didn't look for your program, I would have never understood any of this claptrap in this book. And now I know it's not claptrap. No, it's not claptrap at all. In fact, one of the... Uh, one of their monikers, so to speak, is the guardians of the secrets of the ages. They have hoarded technology, uh, learning, uh, um, you know, for, for all of history. Yes. And uh, well, one thing that I do tell people, you know, when they talk about alchemy, I, 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 it's almost like a mantra with me anymore, where I say, well, you know, alchemy had nothing to do with the transmutation of lead into silver or precious metals. Yeah. It's always been about the control of man's mind. That's right. And, and even in this introduction, there, there's a, uh, uh, a, a passage here where it says, making gold is a trifling matter for them and only a paragon. <laughs> well, it's true. Yeah. I mean, uh, listen, they, they believe that, uh, that a, a nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who have no intelligence. And such people are, are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent. It's easy for them to control ignorant people, to control their minds, to control their actions, to control their politics, to control their economics, to control everything that they do. Yes, and uh, that is through the possession of magical mirrors, bells, hanging lamps, and chants. <laughs> and uh, um, I love it. <laughs> you know, I, I heard the guy going off about Ayn Rand being, you know. Uh, oh, you know, I didn't get to finish what I was going to say about that. To say that Ayn Rand was writing 
uh, what she had learned from Rockefeller, uh, just cannot possibly be true. She's one of the most intelligent women that has ever lived, and what she wrote in Atlas Shrugged was hers and hers alone. Uh, she wrote what she felt and what she believed, and she not only wrote Atlas Shrugged, uh, most people have no idea the plethora of, of tremendous work that she turned out over her lifetime. Yes, so, I would suggest that, that he, he should read like most of her work, and even the stuff today of, of her contemporary um, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, because they learn a lot from him, you know, inadvertently. Uh, see what a lot of the people don't don't really want to, uh, you know, they, they want to paint her with a broad brush because of her her avowed atheism. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, some of her message can be viewed as man, you know, man is God. Okay, but I think she was talking about, you know, man, the individual, as their own God, you know, if that is their choice. Okay. Well, what, what she was trying to do was echo the founders of this country when she said the individual is more important than the group. That's the sum total of everything that she's ever written in her life. That's right. And, and you know, I, there, there was a uh, current movie about her. I wish I could remember the name of it offhand. I saw it with a friend of mine, and, and, and it was a very good movie. Uh, and it was just a biography of her. You know, most people would have fallen asleep through this, and I loved every minute of it. And, mm -hmm. and it is so true. She... She was all for the individual, and, and that is what our Constitution is based on, and, and people still want to go back to the tribes. They want the comfort of the tribes. They want collectivism because they think that somebody will take care of them. They don't realize that in collectivism, they no longer are important and can be sacrificed for the good of the whole, whether whether they've done anything wrong or not. It makes no difference. No, I know, and that's sad. In, in our system... Especially we have to deal with it on a daily basis, and it's yeah. message is so ingrained that, you know, it, it's hard to deprogram people. They don't want to listen. That's because they're selfish. They want somebody to give them everything rather than have to work and slave and be responsible and take a risk of not making it, and which is, to me, uh, I would rather live in a ditch free than ever be anybody's slave in a palace wearing silk robes and eating turkey for breakfast and, and, uh, and smoked salmon for lunch. I would not live as a slave even if I was uh, treated as, as you know as, as well as possibly could be expected I just couldn't I would rather live in a ditch with nothing like God made me with nature and uh, and uh, have the opportunity to use my own brain and make whatever of myself that I could uh, and, and and know that uh, that uh, that was open to me yeah, so be, you know, being uh, among, kind of among the minions of the le uh, of the keeper, and being regarded as a lieutenant, and enjoying all those fineries that uh, that they will shower upon you as long as you toe the line. Because as soon as you don't toe the line, or, or they feel you develop a rebellious streak, or you're too uh, too verbose or uh, too intellectual, uh, you know, against their methods. Uh, they'll eat you every time. You better believe it. And, uh, you know... The slave is a slave is a slave is a slave is a slave is nothing worthless, expendable. And, and systems are, are a way of, of creating slaves. And, and we are truly slaves to a system. Well, it, not really. I'm, I'm not a slave to any system. I'm not a slave to any material possessions. I, I mean in general. P people are... General, know, people in... Of, Two cars in the, you know, two Japanese cars in the garage, yeah. and uh, people in general are. Yeah, and and and, and you know the fiat money that, that that they also love, and they don't even understand <laughs> that they don't own any of their property because of that because of that uh, yeah. that script on there about it being a dead instrument. Yeah, and you try to explain it to them, and they think you're crazy. But I've made the statement many times on this broadcast that you can never be free. You can never ever be free unless you can, without qualm, without crying without feeling sad or bad about it, walk away from everything that you own without looking back and start a new beginning. If you can do that, you're free. If you can't do it, you are not free. You will never be free. You will be a prisoner of your possessions, and all they have to do to make you knuckle down is threaten to take them away. And the other thing is if you're afraid to die for freedom, if you're not willing to die for freedom, you can't have it. That's true. Um, I also got your uh, Dr. Wallach's book today, Let's Say Doctor. Oh, great. And that is a great book. And you know what? I've almost read all of it, just like that woman was talking about earlier. I don't know how you guys can do that, because it's got all these these 
these things in there, and I have to look in, up in the dictionary <laughs> as much as I've read, uh, and, and, and as, uh, as, as literate as I am, uh, there is a lot of these medical terminology that I have no idea what he's talking about unless I look it up, and I just couldn't yeah. go through the book and understand it that way. Yeah, but, but, but I've stayed away from, from the most, um, you, know, you know, with all the um, abbreviations and stuff like that. I'm still, you know, basically I'm in the point of absorbing it now, and then, and then I'll read it for comprehension. Oh, well, see, I'm going through. Absorbing, you know, how he, you know, how he goes about his analysis yeah. and... And, uh, and, and, and his treatment. I'm reading every word. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there will be a one-word book in two months. Oh, yes. So, and, and, and everybody should get a copy and send you a donation as well. That's a fantastic book. And uh, when I get through reading it, I'll probably read it again. I, I like how we attack the Orthodox uh, uh, medical community because uh, my mother, you know, she's not a doctor, but she works with doctors all the time, and, and she knows the score, and, you know, she... she you know, he tells she tells me everything that he says in his book is being true, and 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 you know it's 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 self evident. Anybody who's been around doctors, you know, know that, <laughs> that uh, uh, they make it so that uh, you, you have to go with their orthodox treatment. So that they don't even want to they don't even want to deal with you. And if you ask and if you ask the wrong questions, you know, it, it's almost like you know, they'll shuffle you off to Buffalo. Question. Yeah. You know, by, by either. Uh, you know, steering you down the wrong path or, uh, or uh, you know, just not giving you good care or, or whatever. But, but, but they tend to um, treat you differently. Well, you know, sure. Like once you ask too many questions because, you know, after all, I'm God and, and, and you, know, I, you know, only I can help you. You know, you shouldn't want to be asking these questions because, you know, you should have total faith in me. It's almost like they're faith healers. Uh -huh. Don't look behind that curtain. When somebody says... Trust me. <laughs> yes. That's where I hold my wallet. I want to help you. <laughs> I say, well, let me out of here. <laughs> okay, well, I'll let someone else get out. I've taken a lot of time tonight. Okay. okay have a good evening. Thanks for calling. Bye. <laughs> I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. Uh huh. <laughs> listen to our uh, listen to our closing music tonight, folks. <laughs> you get a you get an earful. Good evening. You're on the air. Yeah, Bill, this is Gary Stone from Nelsonville, Wisconsin. Hi, Gary. Yeah, I wanted to mention a fact now. They only allow books in the libraries that are pol politically correct, you know. And by by rights, we all pay for the public libraries as taxpayers. And and by the, by the library association, the law is everybody's uh, books are supposed to have access to, to the public libraries and be put on the shelves. I had uh, trouble with a library where I live here in Wisconsin. I, I leave a newspaper there, you know, and, and, and they were going to kick me out of the library because I left a newspaper that was exposing certain things. And, and I went to Ralph Nader in Washington, and he forced the library to accept my newspaper that I read, you know. Uh -huh. and, and, and that's how the law reads, but that's not how they do it, though. No, know? that's not how they do it. You won't find... I tried to donate a lot of real good books, you know, about the politicians and government, and the library would refuse them. But by according to the law, they're supposed to uh, allow all different types, like atheist magazines and newspapers and religious and what have you, everybody. Yeah, they're supposed to present every viewpoint, but they don't. No, they don't. Right, right. That's what we got to get back. Yeah, we got to force them to do that again. It's Marx or nothing today. You know, huh? Yeah, marks or nothing. Marks or nothing. Carl, marks or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the way it is. Yeah, well, we've, hey, run, Bill. we've run out of time. All right. Take care. Well, that's it, folks. Good night. God bless each and every single one of you. We'll be back here tomorrow night with another episode of The Hour of the Time. All of a sudden, in the middle of the night, there's a loud knock on your door. Something's not right. Throw out your hands. Clinton's gun law passed through. We're here from the government. We're here to help you. And I'm from the IRS with a power to tax. If you've got a complaint, <laughs> send us a fax. Get out of this house. Surrender your guns. 
give me your gold. You better obey if you want to grow old. Dance with yourself and do what you're told. Hillary Shalala, Reno Janet Dyke, reading the words of General Albert Pike, demonic founder of the Ku Klux Klan, engineer of the Masonic Master Plan. Pike said, Lucifer is God across this land. And Clinton's saying, take the mark in your right hand. While we're all dancing to the drums of up fourth right, Clinton's preparing us for another huge tax hike. Order. Order out of chaos, depression, inflation. Create the panic, then rape the nation. Order. Crisis creation. Incite black and white. Program agitation. But it's not new. Iron Mountain, computer beasts, and cattle mutilations. Black projects, UFOs, and weird genetic combinations. The Nazi doctors didn't die. Come on, get hip. They came here with the OSS through Operation Paperclip. National ID, debit card? Yeah. Vaccination biochip, milk carton kits, genetic engineering. Clinton says her health plans for you and your own good. Sure, and Adolf Hitler's Robin Hood. Order. Masonic mind manipulation. Inciting riots, it's crisis creation. Order. Biochip implantation. Vaccinate your kid for UN identification. This is a test for all of us. So I have today just one simple request. A comprehensive package of health care benefits that are always there and that can never be taken away. Never be taken away. Never be taken away. Atmospheric social illusion. Media hype. Plan confusion. Masonic religion. It's a liar. Not your brain for a Luciferian Messiah. Illuminati thinks that they're enlightened, that they're to be the gods of Earth, born of incest from the sons of Satan and their sisters in satanic birth. Hidden agenda, Kissinger, Nixon, Ford, and Bill, while your kids out back smoking crack for some cheap thrill. They've numbed us down and dumbed us down with fluoride TV drugs, the NEA, and public schools. They've taken your brightest and our best and made him public fools. With managed media, brain-bending lies and stealth, the banksters stole your wealth. Johnson, Bush, Carter, Reagan, Gore, and Dan, they've all been pushing pipes, Masonic Master Plan. Rhodes Scholar Oration, Clinton speaks, then rapes the nation. Luciferian subjugation, New World Order, Illuminati coronation, mass media grand ovation, orders of the quest, think they're superior, they think that they're the best, and you're inferior, you little pest, skull and bones, scroll and key, Knights Templar, Harvard University, they're the Faustian fraternity, Knights of the Golden Circle, Ancient Order of the Rosen Cross, CFR, Albatross, in both parties, <laughs> Rockefeller's boss. MK Ultra ISA from the OSS to the CIA. Mass murder is the game they play. Galileo NASA, Jupiter, Plutonium 2000, dual sun. They'll call it Lucifer for fun. Pyramid Giza, Hitler called it a Luciferian millennium. A thousand points of light. 
Coast, Love of Rome, Thunderdome, Isis, Horus, Lucis, Trust. If the UN lives, y'all go bust. Wake up stupid and read the scoop. Mullen Sutton Griffin and tune in to Coop. Kong, Ron, Thunderdome, you say. Bohemian Grove, Beverly Hall, Lord Betraya, they want it all. <laughs> yeah, they want it all. Kissinger, Ginrich, Army, Buckley, Dole, New World Order, Authoritarian Control. Counterfeits. Uno, dos, one, two, tres, cuatro.